you have your Bibles, open to the book of First John with me, and let's get into the Word. We've had wonderful services this morning, wonderful 9 o'clock service. It was just beautiful. Wasn't last Sunday fantastic? I mean, the morning service was crazy. Then we went into a night uh, candlelight communion service that was amazing. And we've been really blessed to have Ricky Braddy with us the last couple Sundays. Y'all give it up for Ricky. And having my daughters home with us has been a real, a real blessing. So if you have your Bibles, open uh, with me to 1 John. And let's go to the first chapter, 1 John chapter 1. And I'm going to read the first four verses here. This is NIV. So, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Can we say amen? Okay, why in the world am I preaching from 1 John well, the last two Sundays I preached from Luke chapter 2, and we talked about what happened at Christmas. We talked about the manger, no room at the inn, Jesus is born in a manger. Then we talked about the shepherds, the angel appears to the shepherds, and the shepherds get the message and go from there. So we've dealt with what, but now I want to deal with why this morning. Because John gives us the why of Jesus' coming. And what I see in this short passage is four different reasons why Jesus came to earth. Four different reasons why he came. So I'm not going to hold you that long unless something just breaks out here. But that wouldn't be bad either. But anyhow, I know you got a lot going on today and kids are looking forward to gifts. How many open gifts on Christmas Eve? Wow. And the rest Christmas morning? And the rest of y'all don't have gifts, huh? About 20% of the congregation responded. Let's try this again, okay? How many open gifts on Christmas Eve? And then Christmas morning is, yeah, okay, wow. I got worried there. Am I, am I at a Christian church? or we, No, sorry. So anyhow, four different the reasons for why Jesus came. Number one, it's so powerful. Number one, salvation has come to us, and it's by grace. It's right here. Salvation has come to us, and it's by grace. Notice what John said. He said, we're telling you about the word that we've heard, that we've seen, that we've experienced. Doesn't this sound like his writing in the Gospel of John? Same author, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So he goes back all the way to the beginning to talk about Jesus. He doesn't see Jesus as a temporal figure born in time, was not created, and then was created. That's a mistake. He sees him correctly as having always been. From the beginning, but then was manifested in flesh in time and space. Can we say amen? So Christmas means salvation has come, and salvation is by grace. Now there's something that's in here that's important as well. He says this, That which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched concerning the word of life. Meaning that Jesus came, and just like I said last week, John didn't say, once upon a time in a manger, or long ago in a galaxy. I was in that galaxy last night, and it was quite fun, but anyhow. He doesn't say that. It, is, it isn't a sci-fi deal. It isn't a, a fantasy. It's historical, and he anchors it to history. He says, you know what? What I'm telling you about, we've seen, and we've heard, and we've even touched the word of life. I think if John was put on trial and he had to testify, he could come out saying, hey, we handled him. We're an eyewitness. We saw him. We heard him. I'll testify to the fact. I was there with him. I was in the fishing boat when he came to us walking on water. I was with him at the Last Supper. I'm the one who put my head on his chest. 
I was with him when he was crucified. I'm the only apostle that stuck with him through the trial and crucifixion. I'm the one that took care of Mary. I, I'm not telling you a fable. It's not a fairy tale. What I'm telling you is reality. It's anchored to history, and it's true. Jesus came and brought us salvation, and salvation came not through works, but it came through grace. It's hard for us to get this. I still sometimes wrestle with it because it just seems right that we should work for everything we get. We were taught to work, and that's a good thing. The Bible teaches us that. But yet when it comes to our salvation, we can't earn it by works. We're not saved by good works. We're saved unto good works. But we're saved by grace alone. This is what's unique about Christianity among all other religions. All other religions, there's a catch somewhere. There's something you have to do, some act you have to perform, some ritual you have to go through to earn God's favor or hopefully be saved. But Christianity is completely different. Last year, I had an opportunity to eat dinner with some missionaries. I ate dinner with a whole table of retired missionaries. But I, I was sat next to a couple who had spent over 60 years in India. And man, it was amazing. They're called the Howards, Hobart and Marguerite Howard. They've been IPHC missionaries for over 60 years, and they're retired now. But I would say for over two hours, Brother Howard sat next to me, leaned into me, and talked to me about India and his heart just bleeding and pouring out about his love for that nation. And he told me a story, and this is one of the stories that really hooked him into becoming a missionary. While he was in India, he said he was in the town of Varanasi, and Varanasi is, one, is the most holy of seven holy Hindu cities in India. And while he was in that city, he saw this man walking down the road. And he said this man would walk, or he would stop rather, and he would lay down, prostrate himself, extend his arms forward, and then mark where his fingers were. Then he would stand up and walk to that line and then lay down and do it again. And he had been doing this for days as a religious ritual to get to a certain temple. And Brother Howard said, once I saw that, my heart bled for that man. And I thought, Lord, these people need freedom. These people need grace. These people need Jesus. Amen? Amen. These people need to hear that there's freedom and salvation isn't earned. It's received through who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Can somebody give the Lord a praise for that this morning? That's what Christmas means. Second thing I see in this passage is that there's, there's a, the, an interesting word here in Greek. There's a word called koinonia, and it's translated in English as fellowship. When we come to know God, we are brought into fellowship with Him, and we're brought into fellowship with other believers through what Jesus has done. So Christmas means to me, we now have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. There is no other way to God, the Scriptures tell us. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father unless he comes through me. It says there's one door to the sheepfold, and I am the door. If any man tries to come in another way, he's a thief and the robber, right? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I look after my sheep. Man, you ought to read the book of John. It's got all these I am's in it. I am the good shepherd. I'm the bread of life. I'm the word of life. I'm the door. I'm the all the... He is everything we need. He is the door. He is the only way into the fullness of who God is. We, I don't know that we sang it this morning. I, uh, we've done such contemporary versions. But there is a song written by Charles Wesley called Hark the Herald Angels Sing, right? And one of the verses says this. You talk about rich theology. He says, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. He was veiled in flesh, but really he was deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. He was pleased to humble himself and become a man and dwell with men. Yet really on the inside, he was God. Veiled in flesh. And it's this Jesus that has now become the way to the Father. You see, you and I can't come to God on our own. We could never stand before the presence of God in all of His holiness. We wouldn't live. 
The Bible said no man has been able to stand before the presence of God and live just full face. Why? Because we have sin. He is sinless. And if we stand before Him, it's not going to work. The only way we can come before God is through a mediator. And that mediator is the man, Jesus Christ. Last summer, I don't know if many of you followed the eclipse that you know, happened, but we got to see the clips. Eclipse came over America, you know, people were watching it. Well, I was in Bristol, uh, Virginia at the time, and I have a lot of family that live there, so I stopped and ate lunch with my brother and his kids. And I don't even know, me and Jackie were coming from somewhere, and we stopped in Bristol to eat with my family. And uh, lo and behold, the time we were having lunch intersected with the time the eclipse is going to come over Bristol. So my brother's kids showed up, and they had eclipse glasses with them. They looked like 3D glasses you get at the movies, exactly. So we're sitting there, and we're catching up, and we're talking, and all of a sudden, outside, everything just gets freaky looking. It's, it's weird. It's, it was kind of a darkness, but not really, but just kind of, I don't know if y'all got it like that in Elizabeth City, but it was just weird looking. Well, we ran outside. We put those glasses on it. And it was really neat. We were able to see something that would have damaged us had we not had the glasses. Jesus is the only way we can come before the Father and be able to see Him for who He is. In fact, He says in John, No man has seen the Father but the only begotten of the Father. We see Jesus and we see who God really is. He is the only way to God. Somebody shout amen. amen. There's a third thing that I see in this text as to the meaning of Christmas and it's really running as an undercurrent here. Though it's not mentioned, it's still the deal. And that is love is all in this thing. Why? Because if you read the book of 1 John or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the letters of John, he's writing them as an older man. He's using this beloved, um, he's using this endearing term in Greek, uh, my little, what? My little children is the way it comes out in English. My little children. And it's like he's a grandpa talking to his grandkids. And he's, he's, he's endeared to them. He loves them. And he brings this out. And he's telling this story of the love of God. Now think back to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son or only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but has everlasting life. What is the motivating factor there? It's love. You know, there's power in figuring out why. I was just reading a book recently on uh, the power of why. And one guy compares the, the uh, experiment of the Wright brothers to another guy who is like an engineer, fully funded, all these business people behind him, and he's trying to have the first airplane. He's trying to invent the first airplane. The Wright brothers are uneducated and have no money. But they understood something the other guy didn't, and that is they had a passion and they wanted to, they had the why down. Why do we want to do this? We want to fly. We have a passion for flying. And once you find out the why in your life, the how and what seem to line up. That's a free sermon right there that I didn't even mean to preach. But if you figure out why you're doing what you're doing, then you can figure out the how and what. Can somebody say amen? The why of God is love. He loves, that's why He came. He loves, that's why He went to the cross. He loves, that's why He pursues you. He loves, that's why He pours out of His Spirit. He loves, that's why He does the things He does for us. He loves, that's why He called us. He told Israel, He said, I didn't choose you because you were more numerous than other nations. I didn't choose you because you were more powerful than other nations. But I chose you because I loved you. Don't think you're all that. Because you're not and I'm not. It's because He loved us when we were not all that. He came. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, love. Somebody say it's all about love. It's all about love. Years ago, the Russians sent a cosmonaut into space. And when they sent their first cosmonaut into space... 
you know, Russia, the Soviet Union, was supposedly a secular nation. And so Nikita Khrushchev, who was their uh, prime minister at the time, he came out and he declared, there is no God and we've proven it because we've sent a man into space and didn't find him there. Yeah. We sent a man into space and we didn't find him there. Well, at the same time, C.S. Lewis responded to this. He wrote a work called The Seeing Eye. And in this book, The Seeing Eye, he said this. He said, if we're looking for God as a natural person would, would look for God, we're going to miss it. Because we don't relate to God as if he lives on the second floor and we're on the first floor. So if we go upstairs, we're not going to find him. But we relate to God kind of like Shakespeare related to Hamlet. Think back to high school when you had to read Shakespeare and you hated every minute of it. <laughs> but in Shakespeare, Shakespeare had many plays. One of his plays was Hamlet. Hamlet's the main character. He says he relates to, to us like this. In Hamlet, Hamlet can't find Shakespeare, the creator of the play. If he goes up into the rafters, he's not going to find Shakespeare. If he goes on top of a mountain, he's not going to find Shakespeare. The only way he can find Shakespeare, the author, is if Shakespeare himself writes himself into the script. And Lewis said the only way we can find God is if God writes himself into our script. Well, guess what? He has. And it's the Christmas story. He's written himself right into the script. I'm going to come down and I'm going to become flesh. And I'm going to be born of a virgin. And I'm going to be born on the wrong side of the tracks. And I'm going to be born in Bethlehem. And I'm going to give my life as a ransom for many. God wrote himself into the script. Can somebody say amen? Because you see, we can learn so many things about God. Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages said, you can know certain things about God by just studying the universe. We can find out that He's a creator by just studying creation. We can find out that He's an intelligent being by studying the human person. This, this person has a design, the DNA, the structure, the eye. They, all this was designed by somebody. But Aquinas said, but there's certain things about God you'll never get to it has to be given to you by revelation. One of those is that God would become man and be born of a virgin. Actually, it's two of them. Number one, that God would become flesh. That's a mystery that has to be given by revelation. Number two, that He would be born of a virgin is another mystery that has to be given by revelation. This is what Christmas is about. Love conquers and love transcends. How many of you have ever told someone, I love you forever? You've told someone, I love you for." Why do we do that? Why don't we just say, I love you till the funeral. <laughs> then it's over, man. You're gone, and I'm doing my own thing. We don't do that. We, we believe that there's something eternal about love. We believe that love goes beyond the funeral home. What pushes us to put flowers on graves every year? What pushes us to honor our loved ones? Come on, man. There's a love that will never leave us. There's something transcendent about love. There's something that goes beyond about love. Love will be with us always. I told the early crowd, I said, man, Jackie and I dated, and I'll never... You know, when you're, when you're in love with somebody, it just causes freaky things to happen to your emotions. I mean, you start... You act different. You start dressing different. You start looking nice. You start talking nice. You start opening doors. You start spending money, though you were a super tightwad before. You, I mean, it's like all kinds of stuff starts happening, and it changes who you are. It's what love does. Okay. Hold on to that thought. The f final reason I see for Christmas here is Christmas is all about joy. He said, we say this because it brings us joy. You make our joy complete. When we talk about who Jesus is, 
It makes our joy complete because Christmas is about joy. It's about joy. It's something that's an undercurrent that's constantly running in the life of a Christian. It's not just happiness that's fleeting. It's something that's deep and that's eternal. It runs. That's why Christians can be happy in the worst of circumstances. Read Richard Wormbrand's book, Tortured for Christ. He was tortured brutally in a Romanian prison by communist guards. And, I mean, brutal, unheard of torture. And then after this went on for so long, he said, I just fell in love with those guys. And start praying for them. Something transformed his heart. Something trans- that had to be something beyond what you and I know as earthly people. It had to be something eternal. So we know joy by coming to the Lord. And He gives us life. And He gives us happiness. And He gives us joy. I'm telling you, Christians should be the happiest people walking the streets. We should be the happiest people. I don't want to go to a sad church. I don't want to be part of a dead church. I came out of something dead. I came out of the world into life. He said, now we've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. We become a temple of lively stones. We become living, breathing, lively stones full of joy. So let's link these two together. Love begets joy. And Jesus gives us both things. When you love somebody, you get like happy, man. Right? Don't raise any hands, but husbands, I hope you're happy. (laughs) Wives, I hope you're happy. Because love's about happiness. And love, you start talking to people. You start, th- you start dissecting every word that's said to you if you love somebody. Years ago, I told this in the early service, so you're privy to it as well. I was working a job. Now, I've never lived this down in 25 years. I've got a few experiences like that that Jackie's never let me live down. But I'll tell this one. I was working a job in Lexington, Kentucky, and... You know, I came home one night after work, and I was supposed to have called her. Well, I forgot. And I went to my apartment, honest to God, and went straight to bed, wiped out. How many men's ever been there? Thank you. Well, I didn't call her that night. Well, we're dating, and so she freaks out, and she says, what happened? So she starts questioning everything. Are we really in love? Is he really like me? Is this, it's all going downhill, man. And it's just, how many women have been there no raising of hands? You, you, you start dissecting every word and every emotion and everything. And I'm like, Jiminy Christmas, man, I fell asleep. How many guys know when I hit the couch, I come home late at night usually, and we hit the couch, it's like somebody pulled the plug, and I just go, ooh. And they try to talk to me, and I'm like, uh, uh I felt sound like Ozzy Osbourne. I can't talk right now. I just, I just go completely. I'm just like, no. Oh, hallelujah. I didn't know I could bring Ozzy into a sermon, but I can make it happen yet. So it's like, but love causes this, right? Why didn't you call? What are you saying? What did you mean by using the word the? I use it a lot. In English, I don't know, man, but (laughs) love begets joy, which Christmas is all about. So, okay, so we were in Israel the other week, and we went to the city of David. And the city of David is where David actually built his home. He built his palace there, right? But under the city of David is a spring. It's the Gion Spring. And it supplies fresh water to the city of Jerusalem. In fact, it goes to a certain pool called the Pool of Siloam. If you've read the Bible, you've read the miracle where Jesus shows up at the Pool of Siloam. And in the days of Hezekiah, they tunneled out a a tunnel from that Gion Spring all the way under the old city of Jerusalem so that the city could have a fresh water supply during war. Well, I remember going there with Dr. Malky. And going to another one that's in Megiddo where we went too. And Dr. Malky used to teach on the power of the Holy Spirit at these springs. And his words were like this. We as Christians who are filled with the Spirit 
have a secret water supply. It's called the Holy Spirit. And even during times of war or times of of bad circumstances, we can still have joy because the Holy Spirit still flowing in that secret place in our spirit. Deep calls unto deep at the noise of thy water spout. Spirit speaks to spirit and joy comes to us because it's not from this world. It's from another world. Peace we have, it's not from this world. It's from another world. Love we have, it's not from this world. It's from another world. And no matter what's happening in your life, no matter how much you don't want to see those in-laws tonight, whatever, no matter what's going on, you can still walk in there and you can be smiling ear to ear because you got a water source. Come on, down on the inside, bubbling up called the Holy Ghost, full of life and joy and peace and power. Somebody shout amen. Oh, hallelujah. So we're right now, okay, we're Pentecostals, right? We speak in tongues and we prophesy and give words of knowledge. I believe in every bit of that. I believe we should do it more. However, the Bible does say that the day is coming when we're not going to need any of that. 1 Corinthians 13, read it. The day is coming when the words of knowledge will cease. Days are coming when the prophetic words will cease. Days are coming when unknown tongues and praying to the Father in tongues are going to cease. Why? Because, he says, the perfect will come. And the perfect is Jesus Himself. When He comes, there's going to be no more need for those spiritual gifts. Why? As Gordon Feed said years ago, it's like a city at night. You need the streetlights at night. But when the sun rises in the morning, all of those streetlights grow dim. We got all these spiritual gifts. We need to be using them right now. But when Jesus rises in the morning and He comes back for His church, we're going to have the ultimate prophet living with us. We're going to have the ultimate one with knowledge, the ultimate wise counselor living with us. We're going to have the healer living with us then. But notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. He said, so these things will pass away. He said, but these three remain. Did he not? And what remains? Faith, hope, and love is eternal. It will always be with us. That's just good, man. I don't care. I'm getting blessed right now. I feel chills and everything. I'm getting blessed. So what happens, man? We, okay, there was a study done a few years ago by scientists and they concluded that love was a chemical reaction that our neurological senses respond to when certain things happen. Well, they're wrong. It may be a neurological reaction, but there's something eternal behind it. There's something, when we get married, we put these wedding bands on and the preacher, me, usually says, This is the ring, uh, you know, a sign of endless or eternal love. Because we believe it's eternal. That it's never going to end. And what God showed us in Christmas morning was that He loved us so, love was the why. That He loved us so much that He laid aside everything and came down for me and you. And Jesus showed us in the book of Matthew that he just didn't come for all the good people. Matter of fact, he said the whole don't need a physician. Did he not? There should be a scripture like that somewhere. He says the whole don't need a physician, but the sick need a physician. And then Matthew gives his own testimony. He's writing the book, why not? He gives his own testimony. He's a tax collector and Jesus shows up at his place calls him into the ministry, and then goes has a party at his house with his rotten friends. And he's hanging out at Matthew's house, and the religious Pharisees come by because they want to suck every bit of joy out of your life. And they come by, and Jesus knows what they're thinking. 
And the Bible says, and knowing what they were thinking, Jesus said, you know, there was a man who had 100 sheep, and one of them went astray, and he left the 99 and went and found the one. And When he found it, he carried that sheep back and had a party and called all the neighbors so they could rejoice. And there was a lady who had a coin that was very precious to her. We believe it's maybe her dowry he was talking about. And she lost it. So she tore the house upside down looking for that coin. And she finally found it. And she called the neighbors and had a party. And then there was a man who had two sons. And the youngest one came and said, Father, I want my inheritance now. And the father gave him his inheritance. And he went and lived it just as wild as you could, blew every dime he had, ended up eating with the hogs, which is an ultimate disgrace for a Jewish person. They're not, they didn't even own hogs. And he comes to his senses and he said, you know what, even in my father's house, they have better food than this. I will arise and go to my father's house. I'm going to tell him, Dad, I'm sorry for everything I've done. Some believe it was a rehearsed speech. Some believe it was real. But whatever the case, he comes home. And his dad was waiting on him. And he was looking for him. And he saw him. And he ran out. And the son, I think, began the speech. And I think dad said, just be quiet. And he embraced him. And he said, bring out the robe. What robe was that? The robe the sons wore. And put it on him. Bring out sandals. Because he's no longer a servant. He's in my house and he's my family. And bring the ring, the the family ring. Bring it out and put it on him. And then he said, call the neighbors and let's have a party. Why? Because this son who was lost is now found. So, So what's the theme? Kingdom of God's about partying. I'm telling you. All three pass it. Listen, kingdom, not like you're thinking. Now let's get sanctified here. But the kingdom of God is about this one man, the shepherd throws a party. The woman throws a, and the father throws a, telling me that the kingdom of God has something in it which causes joy in our lives. There's something that makes us rejoice and makes us happy and makes us want to call the neighbors and makes us want to lay it all out. Why? What's the why? I'm going to close, but this is so good, man. Y'all can wait on turkey and stuff like that. Come on. I felt a cold wave. It was like. (laughs) Sorry if I offended you. I'm going to close right now. But listen what happens. The elder brother comes up to the father in the last story. Okay, Dad, listen, I got an issue. This one is rotten. And he looked you in your face and asked for his inheritance, which is the equivalent of saying you're dead to him. And then he goes out and he blows every dime. And he comes home and you lay it all out for him. You have a party and we're whooping it up and everybody's coming over. I've been with you and you've never done anything like this for me. I'm the one that's been faithful. He had that religious spirit. And the dad looked at him and said, Listen, son, you've been with me always. But this one was lost and now is found. (laughs) The whole why moving through those stories, Jesus telling them in earshot of the Pharisees, is that the Pharisees were the elder brother. And these people, Lost ones in Matthew's party that night were the prodigals. And that's who Jesus came after. He's telling them, this is why I've come. I've come to rescue. Man, I feel this all the way through. I came for these. I came for the lost. I came for the Hanses. I came for the Rubies. I came for the Tonys. Come on, man. I came for those that don't have a chance. They're not Jewish. They're not coming into this thing. They're not born of royalty. I've come. This is what 
Christmas is all about. It's love is the why, and love is propelling me to come. Oh, hallelujah. Come on, let's stand on our feet right now and give God some praise that He came for you. Come on, can you give Him a hand clap of praise that He came for you? And you know what? When we get home, over to heaven, I'm going to outshout every one of y'all. I don't care. I'm going to outshout, I'm going to outdance Alex and Alex can dance. I'm gonna, why? Because man, that's the way I feel. Do you feel that way? Okay, well let me lay this on you. We don't have to wait till then. Because we got the kingdom now has been ushered in on us. And I'm feeling what's over there. I'm feeling it right now. Hallelujah. I'm feeling that presence of God right now. Why? Because Jesus has done, made a way. And He's already come and given me access to the Father. Hallelujah. Give Him praise. Hallelujah. Okay, let's pray. Father, we love You. We bless You. God, I'm so excited. I pray I pray the best for everyone in here, God. I pray joy wells up in them this Christmas season, Lord. And I pray a newness, a new, just a revival of your presence in their hearts. Just a revival of your presence, God. Tonight when they meet with family, tomorrow when they're eating dinner, I pray a revival of your presence. Let us be thankful for everything you've done, Lord. And we give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed just before we dismiss here. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there one person in here who says, Pastor, I don't know the Lord. You're preaching about stuff, and I love what you're saying, but I I don't experience that in my own life. I haven't experienced it, but I want to. I want to know it. I want to experience the joy. I want to experience Jesus like you have. If that's you, I want to pray with you right now. Right where you stand, I want to pray with you. And if you're in this place, you say, Pastor, I don't know the Lord, but I want to pray and ask him into my heart right now. Let me see your hand. Just lift it up, put it right back down. We're going to pray for you. Or maybe there's some of you in here that says, man, I I used to serve the Lord. I used to go to church like this, but I've just gone cold. And I've grown cold on this, and I've gone away from that. But I want to renew that commitment now in my life. If that's you, we want to pray for you. Let me see your hand if you're in here today. Come on, don't be afraid. If it's you, we're going to pray for you. Thank you, guys. Come on, everybody praying with me right now. Father in heaven. I surrender my heart to you. I surrender all my life. I repent of all the sin. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Fill my life with joy. I believe you're the Lord. And I want to serve you the rest of my days. Thank you for Christmas. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming for me. If no one else... You came for me. And God, I thank you. Now, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that you fill them with joy. You fill them with the Holy Spirit. You minister to them, God, by your power right now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody can say amen. Come on, can we all give the Lord one more praise in here before we dismiss? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thanks so much for watching this podcast or if you're just listening to it. Thanks so much for being part of our church service today. I know the Word is so rich, and when we give attention to the Word, the Word comes in and does amazing things in our lives. You know, I feel in our church that recently we've just been like sitting on a powder keg of the Holy Spirit, and it's just ready to blow. Man, I see lives changed every single week in our church, and it's so exciting. I walk out of here sometimes, and and it's like I've had a surreal experience of just seeing God move and do things that I only previously dreamed of. So I'm so glad that you're part of that today. And you know, the greatest decision you can ever make in life is to serve the Lord Jesus, to ask Him into your heart, to make Him the Lord of your life, to ask Him to take away all the sin, all the shame, and all the guilt. If you'd like to pray with me right now and receive Him into your heart, this can happen. You can pray right where you are, whether you're at home or you're at work or wherever you're listening to this. You can pray right now and ask the Lord into your life And He can do something that no other man can do. He can bring peace. He can bring salvation. He can bring healing. So if you're ready for that, 
Just pray with me right now. Say these words. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin, that you wash away the guilt, that you wash away the shame. I accept you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. Come into my life. Be the Lord of my life and help me to serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. And you can say amen where you are. I want to pray for you now. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone watching. I ask that you bring healing. I ask that you bring deliverance. I ask that you bring peace of mind. Lord, for those struggling with family problems, Lord, I ask that you come in and speak peace to the storm that's going on in their lives right now. And Lord, we love you, we bless you, we thank you today for who you are. Thank you for the audience listening and watching today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So follow us online, follow us on our social media pages. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, till next time, walk with the Lord, be blessed, grow in the word, and go forward in him.